Order, order. I remind honourable members that there have been some changes to normal practice, but well, that's obvious fact. Uh, and this is in order to support the new hybrid uh, arrangements. Timing of debates have been amended to allow technical arrangements to be made for the next debates. So that's why there's going to be a 15 minute interval. There will also be suspensions between each debate. I remind members participating physically and virtually that they must arrive for the start of debates in Westminster Hall. Members are expected to remain for the entire debate. I must also remind members participating virtually that they are visible at all times, um, so no drinking tea or having food, both to each other and to us in the Boothroyd room. If members attending virtually have any technical problems, they should email the Westminster Paul Clark's email address. Members attending physically should kindly, if you wouldn't mind, clean their spaces before they use them and as you leave the room. Uh, members attending physically who are in the latter stages of the call list should use the seats in the public gallery and move on to the horseshoe when seats become available. Members can only speak from the horseshoe where there are microphones. Now, just to be helpful to colleagues, we've done the maths and uh, I'm imposing for backbenchers a three and a half minute time limit. Obviously, uh, front benchers will get the usual time, 10 minutes each. Mike Hill to move the motion. Thank you, uh, Sir David, uh, and it's an, an honor to serve under your chairmanship. I beg to move that um, this house has considered e-petition number 569957 relating to vaccine passports. I also would like to thank the uh, petitioner, Mr. David Nolan, and all the other signatories of this petition, which has reached currently 295,842. And the wording of the petition, Sir David, is as follows. We want the government to commit to not rolling out any e-vaccination status immunity passport to the British public. Such passports could be used to restrict the rights of people who have refused a COVID-19 vaccine, which would not be acceptable. Uh, so David, the petitioner uh, wants me to make it clear that they do not uh, represent uh, themselves as anti-vaccination. We believe so-called anti-vax people are in an absolute minority in Britain in their own words. The petition is not exclusively about those worried about discrimination if they refuse vaccination, but more about the implementation of vaccine passports and its technology for everyone in society. And in terms of comparison with yellow fever, the petitioners want it to be known that comparing this certification alongside any proposed COVID status certification is not a viable argument as we're dealing with very different viruses. Yellow fever certification is only required for up to 30 African and 13 Latin countries. The petition before us today is not difficult to understand and stems from genuine concerns from many of the petitioners. I will say clearly for the record, my support for the vaccination program, and I would encourage everyone eligible for their vaccination to take it as soon as they are offered it by our NHS, who are working so hard to deliver this program on time. It is easy to understand why a vaccine passport may appear to be a perfect option for the government, which is trying to ease the lockdown as quickly and safely as possible. The idea that we could allow events to start taking place at which people who have some immunity so the virus could return to some level of normality is an attractive one. I, like everybody else in the country, look forward to the day when such things can take place again safely and possibly that something could speed us along to that point is a very compelling one. After almost a year of lockdowns and social distancing restrictions, anything which can help to get people back out into the community back into their workplaces, back into their businesses, and back with their families is something which we cannot discount. However, we must also consider the possible drawbacks 
that come with such proposals, and we must consider these concerns with fairness. There are concerns about vaccine passports which go beyond the pseudoscience of anti-vax protesters and Twitter trolls. I will therefore urge members to be mindful of some of these arguments in their contributions. To date, Sir David, the government has not brought forward any concrete plans on vaccine passports or how such passports could work. However, as some countries and travel companies are beginning to require proof of vaccination as a big precondition to booking travel or entering their territory without the need to quarantine, some form of proof may be necessary to at least relaunch our tourism sector. If British holiday makers and travellers are required to have proof of, for international travel, it will be difficult not to have some kind of government issued certification in order to back this up. Even if the UK opts out, opts not to use vaccine passports in the same way as other states, we may be required to provide some proof for those wishing to go abroad if other states require proof prior to entry. If this were to be the case, how it, would look, work, how it would work domestically is unknown. I would invite the minister present to shed some light on this in their summary, as the domestic and international situations are very different. And even if domestic requirements remain low, international requirements may not give us a great deal of choice. The concept of using a vaccine in domestic settings is a concern to some people as we go forward. As members will be aware, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation has published priority lists which will work their way, th way through the population from the most vulnerable to COVID to the least vulnerable groups to it. While it is not always the case, this often does involve going from the oldest groups in society to the youngest. Though again, I must stress this is not always the case. As such, introducing vaccine passports at present would exclude those who have not yet even had the opportunity to receive their vaccine. There is a genuine fear that younger people who do not have any characteristics which would place them on the priority list could be prevented from taking part in events or from taking certain action for no reason other than age and a lack of pre-existing health conditions. Similarly, many people are concerned as to our vaccine passport would properly be would be properly managed as anything that required a smartphone like a current COVID app could bar many elderly people or people living in poverty from accessing such a system. I must also stress at this point that while I would encourage everyone to get their vaccination when they are offered it, people do have the right to choose not to be vaccinated if they wish to do so. Nobody can presently be compelled to take a vaccination under the law, despite it being our best hope in this national fight. The numbers of people currently indicating that they will not take a vaccine when offered is currently very low. And it is my sincere hope that it remains that way for the chances of our recovery. However, the question we must ask ourselves is whether or not such a policy would be fair, for, fair to people who have the right to do this. However, we, we who support the vaccination program might personally feel about their decision. If proposals around domestic uses of vaccine passports are under consideration, as much media speculation indicates, I would invite the minister to clarify any of these proposals in their summary at the end of the debate in the interest of openness and the petitioners. I would therefore invite members to consider some of these arguments carefully in their consideration of the petitioner's requests. Even for those in favour of such a system, we cannot dismiss counter arguments without proper and fair consideration, especially when it comes to ensuring that everybody will have to access, will have access to a vaccine passport in elderly and vulnerable groups, and that those who have not had their vaccination because they are further down the list are not excluded because they have not yet had their turn. Once again, Sir David, I would like to thank Mr. Nolan and, and, and the, all of the petitioners for raising this important issue. And thank you, Chair. 
The question is that this House has considered e-petition 569957 relating to vaccine passports. Now, before beginning the debate, I'm not being old-fashioned or stuffy, but in line with Mr Speaker's wishing, gentlemen, when they are addressing the House physically or virtually, must be properly attired with a jacket and a tie. Mr Steve Baker. Thank you, Sir David, and I refer to the declarations I've made in relation to the COVID recovery group. I will not be pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed or numbered. My life is my own. I quote, of course, from the popular drama in 1967, The Prisoner. It seems to me that nothing has changed in relation to some people's desire to treat us as commodities to be managed by the state. And yet what has changed is the availability of technology to make it so. I'm very grateful to my constituents who've written to me about this matter. And I just would point out we've had a prior debate on this subject, or at least <clears throat> in which I raised this subject. And I thought that uh, the, uh, our, my, my honourable friend, my, uh, for the, the Minister for Vaccines, had ruled out uh, vaccine passports. Um, and I'm very th grateful, therefore, to have this opportunity to hear from the Minister uh, at this stage in the review through this petition, and I'm grateful to the petitioners. I also want to say thank you to Big Brother Watch, who provided a very helpful brief with nine reasons why COVID passes must be stopped. And I would like to just briefly race through as many as I can squeeze in. First, that they will be unnecessary. The availability of effective vaccines, and indeed the government's amazing success in rolling them out, means that those most vulnerable to COVID-19, and soon anyone who wants and is medical eligible for a vaccine, will have a high level of protection from the virus. That means hospitalisations and deaths associated with COVID will drastically fall, and overbearing controls on society will not be justified. I know the government is now looking at COVID status certificates, which brings into play the issue of mass testing. Of course, the ground has been sown with salt on the issue of false positives, I'm sorry to say, often by some apparently eminent people who lamentably neglected the practical evidence from hospitals of real people with real disease. So I hesitate to bring up the issue of false positives, but it has to be said, as we reach an era of low prevalence of the disease, if we carry out mass testing on asymptomatic people, the issue of false positives will undoubtedly be relevant. And we need to hear from the Minister what she's going to do about it to make sure that people who test falsely positive with um, lateral flow tests and indeed PCR don't end up deprived of their liberty unnecessarily. And we very much need to hear from government about that. Of course, vaccine passports would be discriminatory. They would have the effect of socially and economically excluding people who had, had, not, had not had either a vaccine or a recent test result. It is, of course, unlawful under equality law to discriminate against people with protected characteristics, including age, disability, pregnancy, religion or belief. And I underscore belief. I shall have my vaccine when I'm offered it, but there'll be various people for various reasons who will not choose to do so. Making, effectively making vaccines mandatory by implication, by implication through COVID status certification, could leave us in a position where it would be counterproductive. The ev evidence from across Europe shows that if people feel compelled to take vaccines, it puts them off. It would implement, of course, a checkpoint society. Passes for the pub. That would be what it would mean, Sir David. If you want to have your pint, you've got to show your papers. I did not think that was the society we wished to live in. A surveillance state would be instituted. There'd be mission creep. They'd be irreversible. They'd be divisive. And, of course, they'd infringe on the autonomy of the individual. And I lament that I haven't got time to go through in detail each of those points but I certainly will provide the brief to the Minister afterwards. I want to finish with another quote from the prisoner, something which I would ask people advocating for these uh, certification regimes to bear in mind. Number two says, We can treat folly with kindness, knowing that soon his wild spirit will quieten and the foolishness will fall away to reveal a model citizen. And number six replies, That day you'll never see. Carla Locker. Thank you, Chair. The COVID-19 pandemic has asked a great deal of our constituents, and for the last year, the liberties we all enjoy and should expect have been restricted. I know most people who I represent want those freedoms returned as soon as possible in as safe a way as possible. 
The question posed by proposed vaccine passports is whether they are part of enabling all of our society to return to normality. This is complex. Many people look at this through the prism of that will work for me or I have the vaccine, so I'm okay. But as the last year has shown us, as a society, when we pull together and act in the spirit of selflessness, we can achieve so much more for everyone. We need to consider if such a scheme would enable some and restrict others unfairly for their own reasons who have not taken the vaccine. We cannot penalise people who have exercised their right not to take the vaccine. This may be an expectant mother, for example, who just cannot get a piece about taking the vaccine, even with the reassurances given by scientists and health advisors. To penalise this person from public places or services would be wrong. Factor also into the debate that we have so little evidence of the vaccine's effectiveness in reducing transmission that it is simply too soon to be considering taking such a significant step without the evidence of whether it would actually be of real benefit. Chair, in Northern Ireland, we have a very specific set of circumstances with a land border with the Irish Republic. And while our vaccine programme is well advanced, the rollout of the vaccine in the Irish Republic is stumbling and slow, not helped by their decision to suspend the use of the Oxford vaccine. How would vaccine passports work on this cross-border basis for those who work in maybe the public sector or have family who they care for in the Irish Republic and vice versa? It simply cannot work. Chair, I know some industries, airlines, for example, other countries may choose to administer some form of vaccine passports, passports for those seeking to use their services. But in the public sphere, the government must take cognizance of the issues around exacerbating inequality, around evidence regarding transmission and so on. Let us focus instead on encouraging vaccine uptake first and support the world leading scientific research happening here in the UK to tackle the issues presented by COVID-19. However, in closing, I must make clear I would be utterly opposed and believe this government needs to avoid a domestic internal vaccine passport requirement for travel throughout the United Kingdom. We must hold dear to the liberties we once knew and want to return to. Thank you, Chair. Mr Chris Green. Uh, thank you, Sir David. It's a pleasure to fo follow the Honourable Lady uh, from Upper Van and my Honourable Friend uh, from Wickham. And I, I thought the Honourable Gentleman for Hartlepool set out so many of the issues uh, uh, very well. It's uh, also a pleasure to speak in this debate, this, uh, on, uh, this e petition debate on electronic vaccine passports, which is incredibly uh, timely at the moment. Now, I think the starting point is this is fundamentally up to each individual country to make decisions for themselves. As a starting point, it ought not to be, in that sense, for the United Kingdom to take a lead as regard what Brazil or Italy or any other country. Uh, chooses to do and we have to respect those countries and their decisions. It's not for us to determine what they do but I would hope that all countries including the United Kingdom if we do choose at some point to go down uh, this approach for vaccines for other countries, uh, foreign nationals coming to the United Kingdom, we have to consider what we ourselves would do. And I, I think the point that was captured by my honourable friend uh, from Wiccan uh, about the effectiveness of the vaccination program. It's, it's remarkable. I had no anticipation that it would be as effective as it seems to be at the moment. And we've got to recognise that and recognise the protection that's going to be given to so many people right around the world. And therefore, any question over uh, certification for vaccinations or anything else has to be in a proportionate sense. Is it proportionate to the threat of the disease itself? 
And at the moment, that threat is diminishing and diminishing, so actually the need is diminishing. At the same time, there's an escalation in terms of concerns and expectation that the passports will be delivered for many countries. So I, 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 I'm quite sympathetic to the sense of uh, having vaccinations. About 20 or so years ago, I used to be in the Territorial Army, and I went on uh, an expedition called Dillaran Enterprise to Ecuador to climb the Volcan Sangai. And I had a yellow fever vaccination. I got a yellow fever certificate. I think there are minimal concerns over certification if you have a piece of paper to demonstrate your vaccination status. You don't need any fancy electronic reader to read a certificate. You just need to be able to speak the language uh, that's on the certificate itself. Uh, so I'm pretty comfortable with uh, certificates for this. And if there are any questions about forgeries, anything else, uh, companies such as Delarue, based in my constituency, uh, they can do remarkable uh, authentication devices to put on certificates to make sure that there are no concerns over authentication. But if we move from the principle or the approach of paper certificates into electronic certificates, that's where significant civil liberty questions arise. Who in the world will run this database? What data goes into the database? Who determines it? Is it going to be an international body, the United Nations or the EU or someone else? If we can't get an international organisation to take the leadership for it, would it be a big corporate organisation? Would big tech in California have control over this database? And we can see what happened in Australia, where a national government comes into a confrontation with a big tech company. Giving them so much power would be an absolutely colossal uh, problem. I think we need to be proportionate, we need to be cautious, we need to look to paper first and foremost, and there has to be a huge job of justification if you go down the electronic route, and I would not welcome that. Our next speaker couldn't be here at the start of proceedings because he was in the chamber. He might not have heard there's a three and a half time limit. Mr Ian Paisley. Thank you, uh, Sir David, and thank you for your um, chairmanship. It's an honour to serve under it, and thank you for that warning on my time. I hope not to detain the House that long, and I will make a few brief comments. Can I say from the outset, uh, Sir David, I do welcome this debate, and I welcome it because I think it's an opportunity, and I hope it's an opportunity for the Government to vigorously reinforce the view that they are not going to implement passports. And I hope that they use the, the uh, uh, platform today that they will not be doing this, because they are a complete and total overreaction, and completely and totally unnecessary. Uh, the vaccine rollout has been, I believe, a very positive uh, success for the uh, UK. And indeed, the response and support, uh, uh, for example, we had a similar res response for flu vaccine. No one would uh, be saying we must therefore have a passport for flu vaccine to prove that you've had that particular vaccine. And that flu, of course, takes many, many lives each winter in the United Kingdom. And it would be a complete and total overreaction for members here to stand up and demand such a passport for people who have received or not received the uh, flu vaccine. So we don't need it, and it would become a supplementary identity card. I must say I do agree with the comments that were made by my colleague from Upper Van about the knee-jerk reaction by the Republic of Ireland today to stop actually rolling out the Oxford AstraZeneca. And I think that that is more about the failure of the Republic of Ireland have its own successful rollout programme of this vaccine than it is about anything to do with uh, the success or not. I, I understand that something like 17 million people across Europe have received that vaccine and it's been administered uh, to th that 17 million with only about 21 or 31 particular adverse effects. That's a remarkable state of affairs and I think that uh, what we've seen in the Republic of Ireland is more to do with politics and it is to do with science. I, I do believe, as the, uh, my honourable uh, friend, uh, the uh, member for Wickham, ha had indicated that I think that a passport, vac a vaccine passport, would in fact uh, lead to a two-tier society and would increase opportunities for discrimination. And I think that that would be abundantly wrong. And I, I agree that we can't legislate for what other countries do. We might have to, if we want to uh, go to certain countries, have to have 
one of these um, uh, passports or proof that we have received a, a vaccine. But that's a matter for other countries. All we can do is implore them to be proportionate in what they do and responsible with what they do. But domestically, we should not be pursuing this. Uh, if airlines or other countries decide to do it, that is, of course, a matter for them. But we should implore those people and those countries and those organisations to demonstrate proportionality in what they do, because our civil liberties are something that we should cherish and something that we should not throw away so quickly to others to manage for us, because they know better. I think the people know what is best, and we should guard our civil liberties cautiously. Mr John Hell. Thank you, Sir David, and it's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I think this issue needs to be split into two, as the honourable member who began this debate did. It needs to look at it from the point of view of, of foreign um, trips and, and foreign activities, and it needs to look at it from the point of view of domestic um, uh, activities. Now, let, let me turn to the foreign uh, aspect of this first. Um, uh, whether other countries or, or other or indeed uh, travel firms require us uh, to, uh, to, 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 to have a proof of, of vaccination, uh, I think that that is almost certain. Uh, and uh, as, as members of this House will know, for, for, for a number of years, I was the uh, Prime Minister's trade envoy to, to Nigeria, and my body is still awash with an, an enormous number of, of inoculations uh, that, that I had. And I was perfectly aware when, when, I, when I went to Nigeria for, for, for the first time that if I didn't have these inoculations, uh, I wasn't going to go, or I was going to run the risk of being inoculated when I got there with a, a it has to be said, with, with a slightly dubious um, um, quality, quality needle. So, so I, I do think that there is a lot of relevance in, 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 that, in that comparison. And the issue of people who haven't had uh, the, the, the vaccine for medical reasons is one that is easy to take, uh, to take into account uh, by, by, by ensuring that a certificate is given for those people who, don't ha who, who haven't had the, the, the vaccine for medical reasons. Domestically, I think the issue raises a whole number of ethical questions, and I think it is right for the government to review it. It is not the only organisation that is reviewing the ethical issues around this. The Council of Europe, where I lead the British delegation uh, to, to, that, to that body, is also uh, undertaking reviews of, um, of, of, of uh, things like uh, va vaccine passports. And, and it too has come up with a huge number of ethical issues that it, that it has to uh, uh, account for and, and take into account. And, and I think that that is inevitable uh, when we have a, um, a, a, a disease that is, that, that is so prevalent and, and, and has such, uh, such, such enormous effects as, uh, as, as this one uh, does. Whether this discriminates against, uh, against individuals is, is something that the courts are going to have to, have to decide. And, and I think it's inevitable if we go down the, the route of, um, of bringing in uh, a, a domestic uh, vaccine passport uh, that this will end up in the courts. It, it, it's inevitable the way that society has gone uh, that, that, that it goes down, down that, that way. I, I think that is a great shame, uh, but, but, but I don't see any, any alternative uh, to that. So my, 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 my last suggestion is to allow the, the government to conduct its review, to allow the Council of Europe to conduct its review, and to allow that to feed in uh, to, the, to the conclusions that the government is going to produce. Mr John Speller. Oh, thank you, Sir David, and also thank you to um, the honourable member, my honourable friend, the member for Hartlepool, for the very even, balanced way in which he introduced this debate. And I think we should start first with principles. First one is obviously the ethical principle that no one should be subject to uh, any medical procedure without informed consent. That's not just the current law; that dates back into thousands of years of, med of, of medical ethics, and we should stand and we should stand by it. Secondly, we in this house should stand out, up loudly and clearly for progress and science. The, um, the vaccines and medicines 
have transformed societies and the lives of millions ar 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 around the world. Look at the diseases that have been controlled or in some cases nearly eliminated. Diphtheria, uh, whooping cough, polio. Polio, in, in our age, we knew pe people who had polio. It's yeah. incredibly rare now. Measles, rubella, HPV, hepatitis, and of course, the elimination of, 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 of smallpox. This is a triumph of science, and we should be proclaiming it loudly against the sceptics. Secondly, we should, we should also then as, um, applaud, uh, applaud them, and as Harold Wilson said about the white heat of the technological revolution, that's where we should be. And that brings us to practicalities. I agree uh, with the member for Bolton West that um, our, um, our industry here would be perfectly capable of producing secure, val valid validated certificates. And I actually think that therefore I would hope the government were actually engaging with them how, if this were to be introduced, that then they would be able, be able to do that. Or through the DVLA, who produce millions of driving licenses for, 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 for us every year. It is perfectly sensible and, uh, and, actually, uh, and actually imperative for government to be running these in parallel. We do not have to wait, quite bluntly, for the Council of Europe or indeed for uh, government departments here to decide on the ethics without also pursuing the, pra the practicalities as we go on. It is also the case that this is inevitable. Other countries will be opening up their airports to those who, ha who, are, who are able to enter with certificates or, or with, or with a, a passport, however we, however we describe it. Airlines will be, uh, will, will be eager to uh, carry their passengers there. The public will be keen to travel. Uh, will be keen to travel there, and therefore we need to do this in an, or, an or, orderly and, practic and practical manner. And also, by the way, let's not forget those who work for the airlines, those who work at the airports, hundreds of thousands of our citizens who currently are, re are fearful for their jobs, and many of them have lost ha have, have lost them. And those in the travel industry as well. And we, if we are able to produce those certificates, then we should also look and possibly at the domestic settings in order to be able to get many of our industries back to work sooner rather than later. Many of those businesses are teetering on the brink. Those employees are really worried about their jobs and their, jobs and their futures. That's in the, in the hospitality industry. It's sports venues. It's the entertainment industry. Something that we really do rather well in this country, one of the attractions, we should be backing them. Mr William Rack. Thank you, Sir David. It is an unquantifiable pleasure, as ever, to serve under your uh, chairmanship. Uh, and uh, I think the, uh, the prescience of the debate is there's no doubt, but the power of the oratory from the Honourable Gentleman Member for Hartlepool saw the Cabinet Office, during his speech, uh, publish the terms of reference uh, for this particular review and indeed the consultation uh, for it, which now closes on the 29th of March. I, I thank him very much indeed for the, the power of his oratory for uh, making the Cabinet Office uh, uh, announce the publication of those important documents. There are, are three matters for consideration. Uh, the first, as has been alluded to, is international travel. And there is no doubt, as the Honourable Gentleman Member for uh, Worley uh, said, right Honourable Gentleman indeed, uh, Member for Worley uh, said earlier, that that will be happening. And so we're going to just have to uh, get on with that and make sure that we have sensible proposals that chime uh, with our international partners. The more vexed question would be that of health workers. Now, of course, there is the precedent for the hepatitis um, B vaccine, but given the, uh, the concern that there is within the care sector of a, a relatively low uptake of the COVID vaccine, that is where the issue will arise. And I simply say this, after the year that they have had, is it imaginable that the owner of a, a, a care home will say uh, to their care workers that unless you take this jab, you will be dismissed from your employment. That is the consideration what it will come down to, Sir David. And the third issue, and one which I am totally opposed to, is the need for COVID vaccine certification for everyday use by citizens to access venues and services. It has been become unfashionable, Sir David, in politics uh, to talk about things that we believe in, things that we used to know as values. And I dare say that I am a, probably, in this whole debate, an accidental libertarian. That was never such a, 
a description I would have liked to have applied to me before this year, but one which now I fear I will never be able to escape. But I think there are also deeply conservative principles. And I fear there's a strange utilitarian, if not Benthamite, tendency coming in to some aspects of this uh, conservative government and its policy. So yes, absolutely, we must encourage fully the uptake of the vaccine and what a tremendous success uh, that that is and what foresight the government showed in that particular aspect. But I think in terms of the consultation, uh, it was the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster himself who gave, I think, albeit prematurely, the most powerful response uh, to that consultation. When asked on Sky News that will people need such certification to go to the pub, he said no. And I think that's a fair way to begin the consultation. Yeah. Munira Wilson. Thank you very much, Sir David, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I ask you to imagine the scene a few months from now. I can finally go out to a restaurant to catch up with a friend of mine for a real meal instead of the dreaded Zoom meals we've all become accustomed to. At the door, we're both asked to show proof of vaccination. One of us is vaccinated, the other is not. I'm allowed entry, my friend is not. Is that really the sort of country we wish to live in? One in which we have two tiers of rights and discriminate access to goods and services on the basis of health status. Now, too often in this debate, I'm told, well, if everyone has the chance to be vaccinated, it's their own fault if they turn it down. This fundamentally misses several points. There are those who cannot be vaccinated, perhaps for health reasons, or indeed, as a newly pregnant constituent emailed me, she and other pregnant women won't be able to get vaccinated whilst they're pregnant. And if she's able to breastfeed, she won't be able to get vaccinated for the duration of the time that she is breastfeeding either. Secondly, at present, none of the vaccines are authorised for adolescents. Are we saying that teenagers shouldn't be able to go to the cinema with their friends or join a family meal, a uh, family pub lunch? The groups who are least likely to take up the vaccine are among the most marginalised and they will become yet more marginalised by vaccine passports. These passports are essentially a way of making vaccines mandatory. Coercion is never a good way to build trust and persuade people to do something. I would also question whether we are offering false and perhaps even dangerous hope. As the Ada Lovelace Institute says, the vaccine passport is premised on the assumption that my vaccine status tells you something about the risk I pose to you, not simply the risk I face from COVID-19. But as yet, we do not have conclusive evidence regarding transmission and no vaccine will ever be 100% effective. Furthermore, we know that vaccines' efficacy may be diminished by new mut mutations and variants of COVID-19. So a COVID vaccine status would not be of a fixed or standard duration applicable to all countries. And I'd like to end by blowing out of the water this idea that vaccine passports are the key to opening up our economy and society again. The relentless focus on vaccination to the cost of everything else has been the hallmark of this government's approach to the coronavirus since the pandemic began. We have seen from Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, that it is possible to lift restrictions on our liberties with robust public health interventions, both at our borders and through an effective test, trace and isolate system. Our focus should be on the 20,000 people a day not self-isolating, not putting in place a discriminatory system by a government which has proved time and again that it cannot be trusted with personal data. And as we are seeing today with the police crime sentencing courts bill, a government that has once encroached on our liberties under the cover of a pandemic is not minded to hand them back easily. Will vaccine technologies be switched off once they are no longer needed? To quote a member of the Ada Lovelace expert group, once a road is built, good luck not using it. Thank you. Mr. Greg Smith. Thank you, Sir David, and it's a pleasure to serve under your Chairmanship, and many of the arguments in this debate have already been very eloquently made, not least by my honourable friends, the members for Wickham, Hazel Grove and Bolton West. Uh, but I begin uh, with this concept of international versus uh, domestic, and I'm far less concerned uh, with vaccine passports focused on opening up borders. It's not unusual 
uh, to need a whole host of jabs to travel to certain places. I've certainly happily proven my vaccination status for things such as yellow fever when visiting Tanzania in the past, uh, and I think that is right and fair. But domestic uh, COVID certificates, whether used by public services or private businesses, would be intrusive, pointless and wrong. And I fear they would be tantamount to moving vaccination to a more mandatory footing. The World Health Organization released a statement only a couple of months ago saying it was opposed for the time being to the introduction of vaccine passports. But this position uh, being said, there does appear to be a global push uh, towards these restrictions on individual liberty. Uh, and my honourable friend, the Minister for Vaccine Deployment was right, in my opinion, when he stated that vaccine certificates would in fact be discriminatory. Now, I want to be clear that when my turn comes, I'll be having my jab. Uh, and I want to encourage everybody uh, to have their COVID vaccination when offered it. But the vaccine passport concept would disproportionately impact groups in our society where vaccine hesitancy is at its highest. And we cannot allow a position where significant numbers of Britons are turned away from jobs and services on the basis of their vaccination status. Uh, and secondly, some people, as other honourable members have said, can't be vaccinated. There are groups who are medically advised to avoid vaccination uh, from pregnant women, uh, as, as the honourable lady who spoke before me mentioned, up uh, to people with other health conditions, such as a young woman in my constituency who wrote to me who suffers from epilepsy uh, but is otherwise healthy. She is desperate to return to her university and continue her education. So, Sir David, should she not also be allowed to take part in our society? The implication for young people at large would indeed be immense. At present, most young people haven't been offered a vaccine. Vaccine certificates would result in young people facing more stringent social restrictions than others and all through no fault of their own. Importantly, a vaccine certificate scheme may also be counterproductive, with research showing uh, that compelling people to take vaccines does not necessarily result in the higher uptake we all want to see. Individuals are best placed to make their own choices. Now, I'm incredibly proud of the progress the United Kingdom has made in the vaccinating the population, but this should be used to set people free, uh, not restrict their freedoms further. And I close uh, with the view that I fear that should vaccine certificates become commonplace, they would inevitably expand and endure beyond the immediate challenges of this pandemic, which I do not believe should be allowed to happen. Yeah. Uh, Mr Paisley has had to temporarily leave our proceedings because he's on the call list in the main chamber. Mr Alistair Carmichael. Uh, thank you, Sir David, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I add my voice to those in this debate who have spoken about the importance of us all encouraging our fellow citizens to take up their vaccination? On Wednesday morning, I shall be joining the queues in the Pick Cry Centre in Kirkpo to have my vaccination, and I very much look forward to the extra freedoms that that may allow me to have. It is worth remembering, though, Sir David, that one year ago, we all as a country surrendered a significant number of important freedoms to the government. It was unnecessary and it's a thing to do at the time because we were facing something where we did not really know how it was going to uh, pan out. One year on though, we know an awful lot better how we have to deal with this pandemic. We see the greater in uh, increase of our fellow citizens who are now getting vaccinated and the efforts of the government, I would suggest, should be about returning our liberties rather than tightening them further. And that is why I oppose this idea of vaccine passport. And looking at the call list for today, I think that the Honourable Member for Worley and I are the only people who were in the House and who are in this debate today at the time when the Labour Party and government then passed the Identity Cards Act in 2006. And I'll just remind the House why it was that many of us opposed that particular measure. It wasn't just the idea about having to carry an identity card. It was because along with that identity card, there came the need for a register and a database. And it was the considerations of the cost of that and the security implications for government holding so much data that many of us opposed it. And I would say 15 years later, 
nothing has changed. Of course, there will be some occupations where it will be sensible for employers or others to ask for evidence of vaccination. But that is a very different proposition from the one that is being put to us today. To call it a passport is actually a very good analogy. Consider this. In theory, you only need your passport if you are going to travel abroad. But in practice, I can tell the House, I've often had to argue the case that it's not necessary for me to get produce my passport to get in a plane at Heathrow to go to Aberdeen. We're required to produce passports for all range of things these days. And if you think you only need to travel abroad, then go try, Sir David, opening a bank account or instruct a new solicitor without producing a passport. And of course, once we accept that it's OK to have a passport for COVID, where else is that argument then going to go when the threat of COVID has receded? If it was OK for COVID, why not require people to produce one for HIV, for example? What we have here today is the very thin end of a thick and dangerous wedge. The concept of a vaccine passport is not just some matter of administrative convenience. It is a first step, step in a major redefinition of the relationship between the citizen and the state, and I would suggest that it is one we should not take so lightly. When freedoms are given up, then the state rarely rushes to return them. Remember how it was the last thing about identity cards. It was only going to be for the duration of the Second World War, but seven years after the end of that war, it required a citizen to take the government to court to end it. That is why this matters. Mr Ben Bradley. Thank you to David. It's uh, difficult to come right at the end of it uh, as the last member on, on this government side to speak. But of course, so much has been said already in this short debate, which has been full uh, of uh, some excellent points, particularly my honourable friend and member for Wickham. I wanted to just very firmly uh, and clearly lay out my position on this issue of vaccine passports. There are very different versions uh, in the media of what this looks like. We've had what one might consider a vaccine passport for international travel for a long time, where if you want to visit Africa or South America, you have to prove you've had the relevant inoculations, most commonly probably malaria, but for other diseases too. Uh, and people who make those journeys do that routinely as part of their travel. But the key point for us, though, as, as colleagues have covered, is when it comes to those decisions, they're not something that the UK can unilaterally decide. We don't have the powers to tell other countries what to do about immunizations, including the COVID vaccine. If, if Guatemala want visitors to to have vaccine then that is up to Guatemala so it does make sense in my view for the UK to have and uh, adapt a system by which people can prove their vaccine status if that's what they want to do it's probably highly likely to be something that people will need if they want to travel extensively uh, it's largely up to other countries so we'd be well advised uh, to have something like that available for people to access uh, importantly if they choose to do so um, if that has to be a database somewhere I see no reason why the existing NHS app couldn't be adapted to that function or some other means where data like this is already shared and I hope ministers will look at that before they try to reinvent the wheel. There's also in my mind no reason why this couldn't simply be done on paper rather than requiring all this data sharing uh, and the minefield that comes with it. You already get a certificate or an email when you get your test result which could be used as proof. Uh, on that note I think it's worth saying that I don't and I'm yet to find anyone else who has a problem with the idea of proving a negative test at least in the short term Obviously, we hope that all this goes away and we don't have to do it for long. But in the interest of getting uh, events up and running, businesses up and running much faster, uh, it might make sense for people to show that in order to attend a mass event like a football match or a concert. I think businesses would welcome that if it helps them get up and running faster. And that's something we could and should look at. But importantly, that's the line for me. And I think for many others, I believe in the vaccine. I think it's a great feat of science and innovation uh, to be able to deliver it. And I believe everyone should have it. I will have it when my turn comes. But we're asking people to inject something into their bodies, a medical procedure, and that requires consent. That should be a very basic idea that we subscribe to, and no government should be in the business uh, of mandating or coercing people uh, to do that. As much as we may feel getting vaccinated is the right thing to do, uh, people have rights and responsibilities over their own bodies, and I absolutely draw the line firmly uh, at coercing people to get vaccinated. That seems clearly to be discriminatory and would certainly lead to a legal challenge. We have to win the argument, recognising that some people won't want or won't be able to for whatever reason, and that's their free choice. So this idea of a vaccine passport, as some describe it, as a requirement to prove vaccination status before being able to go to the pub or events, or as some have suggested, to get a job, I think is truly abhorrent. I think it would be coercion on a level that I've never seen 
uh, in any democratic country and not something I could ever support. The idea that any government, never mind a conservative one, would say no jab, no job, uh, I think is entirely morally wrong. I assume, therefore, that there are no plans to do this. I hope that the minister will reaffirm this. I've been told by other ministers in the past that there are no plans. No matter how much I may personally believe that it's important and the right thing to take it, it would fundamentally impact on people's basic rights to uh, require that vaccination status to be shown in our daily lives for our very basic rights and be a huge backward step for our liberty and freedoms. Mr Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr Chairman. An, an absolute pleasure to speak on this issue. Uh, I've seen many people contacting me and to make clear from the outset, I've come back to my office today uh, after having went for my vaccine shot and I've had it as the first one done and, and I look for the second. I annually take a flu shot due to my diabetes and booked in as soon as I was able to, able to get the COVID vaccine on the list as prepared. I'm not a medical person. I don't understand the in-depth uh, biology and virology that is needed for a discussion on the vaccine. I've made the decision in the same way that I trusted the doctor when he put me on the, my diabetes medication without researching the clinical trials. I will be happy, and I am happy to take this vaccine and have done so today. However, the key part in this statement is that I've chosen to, I was advised to do so, and I followed the advice, but ultimately it is my choice. I'm happy to encourage people to take the vaccine. I've often this house press ministers for greater availability for teachers, for instance. However, I will never instruct anyone to take it. This is not my place. It is my reasoned opinion. The message that is coming through loud and clear to me is that there are many who are pleased to be able to access a vaccine. They see it as a first step towards regaining normality. And I've repeatedly had correspondence and email from people asking when they will be eligible to get it. Just as a GP will not force anyone to make, take medication they're they not happy with, even if they sincerely believe it to be to their best interest, neither can nor should this government play a part in enforcing vaccination by introducing a vaccine passport. It is absolutely right and proper that government investigates the pros and cons, follows all their nations in doing so. However, the most recent report I read made it very clear that the vaccine programme had been incredibly successful without threatening the removal of freedoms. So more than 24 million people so far have had the first vaccine dose and about one and a half million have had a second. Uh, and let's hope that the number uh, uh, of doses will, will rise over the next few days. People want this. Um, and, and eight and ten people stated they would take a vaccine if one was available for them this week and they took the survey up to 55 percent in November shortly before the first COVID-19 vaccine was approved and to achieve the herd immunity it is understood that we should have around 80 percent take up so we must understand that there are those who are unsure they should take a vaccine those with serious underlying health conditions for instance they should never be isolated because they cannot provide a copy of the vaccination card with it. I can remember whenever I went away with the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme to Kenya, we had the vaccinations. It was required and it was for our better health. Uh, and and, and uh, that's uh, some time ago. Um, but, but the right to not be isolated or indeed, as one constituent said to me, ostracised for a personal medical choice can never be something that this government enforces upon our own constituents. I'll end where I began, Mr Chairman. I got the vaccination. I've been very happy to do so. But that has been my choice. I must remain so without enforcement through COVID passports. And I urge government to hold fast to what that matter has been throughout, that they are deeply spiritually reluctant to make any of these impositions or infringe anyone's freedom. Th throughout COVID, the public have permitted the curtailment of personal freedom for the greater good. But this vaccine passport, I believe, takes us a step further that money will be comfortable going. Again, I urge you, take the vaccine when you have the opportunity, but I will certainly not be preventing you from accessing my advice centre, our office, and my staff, if your health or other reason forbids you from doing so. Mr Chairman, thank you. Mr Martin Day. Thank you, Sir David. It's a pleasure to virtually participate in today's de debate under your chairmanship. May I start by commending my petition committee colleague, the Honourable Member for Hartlepool, for his opening speech on behalf of the committee. The impressive manner in which he did so set the scene for the rest of the debate. It is one of the more interesting debates to emerge from the coronavirus pandemic, with implications for health, business and serious ethical questions. This is not some theoretical or abstract debate, it has considerable real world implications for us now. As part of its reviews of easing lockdown restrictions, the UK government has declared that it will review the ethics and legality of vaccine passports. 
domestic COVID certificates for UK businesses, venues and hospitality. FAGA, which specialises in holidays for the over 50s, says passengers on its 2021 holidays or cruises must be fully vaccinated. Australian airline Qantas says travellers will eventually need to prove they have had vaccination to board its flights. Some UK businesses have declared that all employees must be vaccinated or face a review of their contracts. However, the legality of this has been disputed by employment lawyers, lawyers and trade unions. The Justice Secretary has said this may be legal if it were written into contracts. Israel has developed a mobile app Green Pass to show that a person has received a COVID vaccine. It can be used to access indoor seating in restaurants and to attend events in stadiums, among other things. And in the US, President Biden announced an assessment of the feasibility of linking COVID-19 vaccination to international certificates of vaccination or prophylaxis, the ICVPs, and producing electronic versions. I myself have asked numerous parliamentary questions over the past year about vaccine passports, as this is an issue which I know interests many constituents with views both in favour and against. And there are many ethical considerations with arguments that passports are discriminatory. Vaccine hesitancy is more likely in BME communities and cultural uncertainty exists. Poorer communities are also less likely to be vaccinated. Some people are medically excluded from vaccination. Issues like whether a child is vaccinated or not may also be influenced by the wealth and parental education or even just the place of residence. Then we have issues around data protection of any scheme, the security of it and the risk of fraudulent or fake certificates which could undermine the process. And there's questions as to how long certificates would be valid for. Now, taking every step to eliminate the virus needs to be our priority. However, the top priority right now, in my opinion, must remain successful continuation of vaccine rollout. On the 15th of January 2021, the World Health Organization Emergency Committee on COVID-19, while agreeing to further investigate the efficiency and utility of vaccine passports, recommended that states at the present time do not introduce requirements of proof of vaccination or immunity for international travel as a condition of entry, as there are still critical unknowns regarding the efficiency of vaccination in reducing transmission and limited availability of vaccines. Proof of vaccination should not exempt international travelers from complying with other travel risk reduction measures sound advice in my opinion. In its response to the petition, the UK government has said the government is reviewing whether COVID status certificates could play a role in reopening parts of our economy, reducing restrictions on social contact and improving safety. The Scottish government is also considering the role a vaccination certificate might have. However, it is too soon to introduce any form of certification. Experts and ministers still need to know more about the efficiency of the vaccines, their impact on transmission and the length of immunity before it would be safe or sensible to introduce a vaccine certificate. To this end, the Scottish Government continues to engage in international developments in relation to COVID-19, including on the subject of vaccine certification. This includes consideration of technical details, ethical and equality issues and, of course, privacy standards. The outcome of those discussions will guide the Scottish Government's work in this area. A vaccine certificate could play a valuable role, but there are various issues to work through, not least the significant equalities issues with allowing freedoms only to those vaccinated. I do think it's worth remembering that vaccine passports are really a new name for something which is not a new idea. Indeed, they have been almost universally adopted or supported at various points in history, the first international certificate of vaccination was introduced in 1944 as proof of vaccination against smallpox and throughout the following decades led to a significant reduction in the international spread of the disease as ever more travellers were required to be vaccinated. After the declared eradication of smallpox in 1980, the smallpox specific certificate was cancelled, but the precedent has been established and countries have continued to adopt vaccine regulations when there is a significant 
threat posed to public health. Several countries already have some form of vaccine passports in place requiring proof of vaccination documented on an international certificate of vaccine or prophylaxis before you enter or when you leave a country. Indeed, like many others, I already have one of these certificates. Polio vaccinations, for example, are still mandatory for travellers to and from countries still afflicted by this terrible disease, and many countries require proof of vaccination for yellow fever for all arriving travellers. This applies even to those travelling from somewhere not designated by the World Health Organization as a yellow fever risk country. So we have plenty of examples upon which to draw. With regard to COVID, in a number of other countries, all international travellers are required on arrival to stay in designated hotels, generally at their own expense, and this has proved an effective way to minimise the risk of importing new cases. STAGE has reportedly advised that only a universally applied policy will be effective in reducing the risk of importation. The Joint Biosecurity Centre has made clear that a blanket approach to a managed isolation is required as it cannot confidently assess the risk of new variants appearing in other countries. Unfortunately, the UK government continues to rely on a targeted approach for international arrivals. As a result, the Scottish government has taken the approach to go further than England and require all international arrivals to enter hotel quarantine. This has been managed as part of a four nations approach with the UK government managing the online booking system and the hotel contracts. The Scottish government continues to press the UK government to adopt a more comprehensive approach and quarantine all international arrivals. The SNP's preference is to have a consistent quarantine rules across the UK to effectively prevent new variants from entering Scotland and undermining the vaccination programme. One of the challenges of a certification approach is that experts around the world are still learning about the vaccine's effect on things like the transmission of the virus, a challenge that has been recognised by the World Health Organisation and SAGE. The Scottish Government continues to engage in international developments in relation to COVID-19, including about vaccination certification, and these discussions are led globally by the World Health Organisation and will include consideration, technical details, ethical and equality issues and privacy standards. As I've said earlier, it's too early yet to assess whether this is viable, but it is appropriate for governments to continue to keep vaccine certification under review as further evidence around vaccines and immunity emergencies. In conclusion, there may be some merit to certification in areas such as international travel. However, we need to be wary of creating some dystopian future where those with a recent vaccination can lead a full and normal life while those without become second-class citizens with severe restrictions on their freedoms. Of course, neither the Scottish nor UK governments will have the authority or power to stop other countries from requiring travellers taking the coronavirus vaccine before going to that country. What we do here, though, is up to us. And at present, keeping this matter under review is probably the correct position for the time being. So let us stay focused on getting people vaccinated and eliminating the spread of the virus. Thank you. Fleur Anderson. Thank you, Sir David. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship. And I'm very grateful to the Honourable Member for Hartlepool for his leadership of this debate and for having taken it on behalf of the Petitions Committee and for further sharing the concerns of the petitioners to us all. As he said, over 290,000 people have signed this e-petition that we are debating, which shows the strength of feeling on this matter across the country. And it, that includes 700 people in my own constituency of Putney. The question of vaccine passports is crucially important and a very complex one, but it does need an answer soon. So debates like today are very welcome. There are so many issues and considerations at play here. And I'm therefore very pleased to be able to contribute on behalf of the opposition today. And we've already heard some very interesting contributions this afternoon, raising many questions that need to be heard. We heard from the member from Hartlepool um, in his opening that there, were, there are concerns of people who are younger and have not been offered the vaccine yet. So the timing of this will be important. And concerns of people about the technology of any passport or certificate, especially if it's digital, for people who don't have the tech, such as smartphones. 
we heard for, from the member for Worley about the, the important principle of no medical treatment without consent and also needing to be led by the science on this. And questions about whether there are make plans being made as a kind of contingency plans for the rollout of certificates in parallel with, parallel with these discussions about the ethics of this debate as airlines will be rolling this out already, it will be happening. We just heard um, from the member about Saga holidays needing vaccines. So how will this be possible? What documentation will be asked for? There will need to be some answers to this. But also, very importantly, from the member for Work Worley about the impact of getting business back to work and saving jobs. And that needs to be a very top consideration in this debate. As members have said, it's been an absolute delight to see the success of the vaccine rollout. And I commend all people who've worked so hard in creating and distributing the vaccine. They are all heroes. And I want to echo the Honourable Member for Nottingham North, who, speaking back in December in a similar debate, made clear that the root of a lot of these discussions is about vaccine hesitancy. Vaccines are the most effective public health intervention either in relation to coronavirus or health in general. And it's the ultimate ticket out of this crisis, something I think we do all agree on. It's therefore hugely important that a significant proportion of people will take up the vaccination, especially those with the greatest vulnerabilities. And I, as many other members, will be taking up the vaccine as soon as I am offered it. Those who are hesitant to take the vaccine should not be mischaracterised as anti-vaxxers. That is not fair or true. Those who spout anti-vaccine conspiracy theories are a very small group of people indeed. There's a much more significant and noticeable number of people who, though far from the majority, are vaccine hesitant. And I've spoken to local GPs in my own constituency about this. There may be a number of reasons why people do not want to have the vaccine and we need to respect those. Others may not want to do so out of safety concerns, something I've heard from some of my constituents. They will want to be sure that any vaccine, be it for COVID-19 or anything else, is safe. And we all have a role to play in giving them confidence. But there are some serious practical matters that the government should address to help improve the vaccine take up. For example, the GMB union has highlighted that the government's anti-adult social care infection control fund provides full sick pay for sickness in social care, yet it does not financially cover the immediate aftereffects of having the vaccine, for which some people it makes them poorly for 24 hours. Now, we don't want any low paid social care workers to be hesitant that they may lose a day's pay if they have the vaccine. And so if that reason can be taken away from them, that will increase vaccine take up. What we do want to see through these developments, through our experiences in this country, is that the best, best method of countering those views is through proactive, positive, health-promoting campaigns. I know that this is something the government is doing. I'm following it very closely, and it's very welcome. And we will support the government in this. But if they do decide to introduce vaccine passports or certificates in any way, I hope that they continue with the health-promoting campaigns as a priority. Vaccine passports or certificates or any other name are one of several possible responses to vaccine hesitancy and may well play an important role in reopening the economy and society and keeping residents of care homes safe, for example. But they may be unnecessary and unable to be implemented fairly. This is a highly complex area and there are no easy answers to this issue. So we're going to need to have a national conversation about this and the Labour Party will play its part. Our principle is that the government must not abdicate its responsibility and simply leave this to the private sector to do any way and haphazardly. This will only lead to confusion and unfairness. Any decisions on vaccine passports must be based on firm evidence, such as the effect of vaccinations on transmission and international best practice from other countries that have implemented vaccine certification schemes. And there are currently several country-based examples for us to observe, for example, in Israel. We all want lockdown to end, and we all want as many people as possible to take the vaccine. On the one hand, vaccine passports could provide an extra layer of protection for the vulnerable. They could be effective in protecting workers 
and could give businesses in certain sectors the confidence they need to go forward. There are, however, very legitimate concerns over the implications of vaccine passports for civil, civil liberties and for discrimination, and we cannot ignore either. We don't want to see a two-tier system whereby those who are not vaccinated, especially the marginalised, are blocked from essential public services, from work or from housing, or to see the passport extended beyond that is legally required and abused, or extended in time. These are all hugely important considerations for the government to reflect on in making this decision, so we welcome this debate. I would like to end with a few questions for the Minister. I understand that the government is reviewing whether COVID status certificates could play a role in reopening parts of our economy, reducing restrictions on social contract, contact and improving safety. Could she share with us the progress so far of this review and what it has found so far? What external advice is the government drawing on during this review in order to inform the review's recommendations? Is there research on the impact of a certificate on vaccine hesitancy? And finally, if the government does proceed, how will they nav navigate these questions posed by civil liberty groups and ensure that the passport does not create a two-tier system? This is a hugely important discussion, navigating new territory for us. But they do need to be answered sooner rather than later. And it's vital that the government listens to all voices for and against, including those who have signed this petition. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Sir David. It's a pleasure to serve under your <coughs> chairmanship. Can I start by congratulating all members who have spoken in this debate today and also helped secure this debate, in particular the Honourable Member for Hartlepool, and also congratulate the petitioner and uh, everyone that has signed uh, this petition which has led to this uh, debate today. And it is a very timely debate for a number of reasons. It is first of all a preemptive strike because the COVID status certification review has yet to commence, indeed, uh, as my honourable uh, uh, friend uh, alluded to the terms of reference uh, and some detail about what it will consider has been published uh, today and is available uh, to look at on the government website. And it will be my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who will lead on this and primarily will be looking at those domestic uh, facing issues that many members have referred to uh, today and it is indeed wider than vaccinations. It looks at testing and uh, a whole array of issues. Uh, just to be helpful to honourable members, um, in parallel to that, there is work going on also led by the COVID team in the Cabinet Office uh, on the international facing issues and the travel issues which members have spoken about uh, today. Uh, and that group is a cross-government group and is chaired by the Secretary of State for Transport but uh, feeds into the COVID team in the Cabinet Office with um, CDL having ultimate responsibility for uh, that. And um, the uh, review will report in advance of step four on the roadmap, which, as honourable members uh, will know, uh, will be no earlier than the uh, 21st of June. Um, the uh, review will uh, is in part because the government committed to the COVID-19 uh, response in uh, spring of this year to review the potential role of such certification as we uh, handle COVID-19 from summer onwards. Uh, the review will assess whether such certification could play a role in opening up the economy and society uh, on reducing restrictions on social contact and also uh, improving safety. But what I want to also reassure honourable members is that uh, we very much want to return to our normal way of life and that's not just uh, the lifting of restrictions, it's all the other things that we have previously enjoyed and have missed over uh, the last 12 months. The review will consider whether uh, the extent to which certification would be effective in reducing risk uh, and whether it could be effective in helping open up parts of the economy 
It will also look at the ethical equalities, privacy, legal and operational aspects of such certification and the implications of that for those unwilling or unable to get vaccinated. And that includes um, the inequalities, uh, implications which honourable members have referred to, and the impacts on certification on those groups disproportionately affected by uh, the pandemic. Could you I, I will, yes. I'm very grateful. There's many questions I'd love to ask, but one in particular. If people choose not to get vaccinated, can she confirm that they will bear their own responsibility and that the rest of us won't be held back because some people have made a personal choice not to have the vaccine? If they don't want the vaccine, that's fine. They shouldn't hold the rest of us back. Um, well, I can't give the Honourable Gentleman many answers uh, today as, he, as uh, this review has just started. But what I would say to him is that uh, in all of this, we have to remember that the reason why we are charting our way out of uh, this situation, uh, in part, yes, due to fantastic science and the success of the vaccine programme, is because members of the public have taken care and taken responsibility for themselves and other people. We haven't legislated for that to happen. That has happened because people feel motivated to take responsibility. And I think we have to remember in all of this, even though we're very used to passing laws, talking about enforcement and all of the other things, that ultimately this has been about the British public taking responsibility for themselves, their families and their, and their communities. The, the Honourable Member for Hartlepool uh, spoke about, uh, and I thank him for it, the uh, setting out at the, the start, why this is not uh, a, a call from anti-vaxxers or COVID sceptics. It, it's not. It is very legitimate questions that are being raised around uh, our freedoms and the practicalities and the implications of this uh, on people who are disproportionately uh, affected by, uh, by COVID. And uh, he also raised the issues about the level of control that we have over uh, decisions that may be taken in international forums. As I understand it, any international agreement would be years off if there was an initiative, for example, spearheaded by the World Health Organization. That would be uh, many years uh, down the line. But we are in control of what we decide about our own borders and our own uh, systems. But clearly, uh, Secretary of State for Transport and others are talking to international counterparts to, to get something that makes sense and also to uh, learn from uh, good practice. He also spoke about those who uh, are not able to have the vaccine. People have spoken about uh, physical health conditions. There are also mental health conditions as well. Uh, I have been speaking to people who uh, have a severe phobia of needles uh, and could not in any way be injected. And I know that uh, vaccine companies are looking at alternatives, but at the moment we don't have uh, those alternatives. The Honourable Member for uh, Wickham spoke very powerfully, as he always does, about uh, our freedoms. And I, just as an aside, um, uh, did look up the prisoner Patrick uh, McGugan qu uh, quote that he gave, powerful quote. Uh, I, I have to say, he didn't say the uh, preceding two lines, which were, I will not make any deals with you and I have resigned, which may well be, uh, he's used those in, uh, in other, other debates. But... Um, but he does make a very uh, powerful case about the practicalities of this. Uh, the, uh, is it actually going to have a, a practical effect if we were to bring it in? Uh, I, he raised very important points about equality, and I can confirm those are in the terms of reference. And uh, also, I hope he will take some comfort uh, from what uh, ministers have said in the, in the past uh, about... Uh, uh, papers for uh, uh, having a pint. I think that that is the uh, approach that people want to take, but it is right that we look at these issues and we look at them in a, in a transparent way. And again, this debate will help inform and steer uh, that review. I will, yes. They can be giving way, but isn't one of the fundamental rights the ability to work? And huge numbers of our citizens are not able to work. Many have been made unemployed. Many are teetering on the edge because their businesses are on the edge. Surely the vaccine the task force has shown us how you can move prudently and at pace. And maybe we need to be getting a bit of urgency into this. Uh, 
Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Member um, for, for those comments, and indeed uh, his, his comments in the debate. Uh, he is right, and I think actually uh, everyone uh, in, the, in this House, and uh, no matter which side of the, the argument they're on, what we want is people to be able to get back to those, uh, those freedoms that we have perhaps taken for granted, the freedoms not just to be with our loved ones and, uh, uh, and have a social life, but, but to actually earn a living. And the cost uh, of the last 12 months to, uh, to individuals being able to do that has been, has been really devastating. And I think we all understand that, which is why we want to look at all the practical measures we can to give those people as much certainty uh, in the future as possible, which is why we need to ensure this review looks at the practicalities of doing this. What is the upside if uh, this were to come to pass? Um, the Honourable Member for Upper Barn um, uh, spoke uh, about the importance of evidence in this and clearly uh, in particular about um, the effect of the vaccine on uh, transmission rates. She also spoke about um, uh, pregnant women as other uh, honourable members uh, have and I think that in a week where we have uh, been looking at uh, uh, how women are shortchanged in a whole variety of ways and many women still complaining when they go for job interviews about questions around are they pregnant, are they planning a family, etc, uh, etc. Et I think that uh, anything which puts further weight on someone having to demonstrate, you know, why they haven't had, why they've not got a, a certificate, would be uh, uh, would be very uh, disappointing indeed. The honourable member for Bolton uh, West uh, focused on the importance of trust and uh, the fact that the public, uh, uh, thank you, uh, the public are, are going to um, uh, ultimately that is that is how we are going to get through this. That. We have to uh, rely on that uh, and uh, not so much focus on uh, government action. The Honourable Member for uh, North Antrim uh, spoke uh, very uh, eloquently about um, uh, the uh, absolute um, uh, issues around civil liberties and also uh, about uh, certain uh, individuals who may be missing out, particularly those who will be vaccinated uh, later uh, in, uh, in the programme. And the Honourable Member for uh, Henley also uh, emphasised that we have to listen to others' experiences and uh, ideas. Um, the uh, Honourable Member for Wherley uh, raised the issue about international travel, which uh, I have addressed, uh, and also uh, that people um, are more likely to be um, uh, open to data being shared and, and so forth if there is a benefit to them and I think this is what we need to come back to in this review what is the benefit to our citizens of, uh, of doing this the Honourable Member for Hazel Grove uh, and Chairman of the um, Public Administration Committee raised the issue of uh, employees and again uh, that would be a matter for individual employees and my understanding is that uh, contracts would have to be rewritten if this was going to be uh, made uh, compulsory and uh, I would also uh, off the back of his comments uh, just pay tribute to all the healthcare professionals who are doing an incredible job phoning up individual people who have concerns about taking the vaccine to reassure them and I think that is the way uh, and, and huge effort needs to be made there and is being made there to give people confidence that they can uh, they can take uh, this vaccine. The Honourable Member for Twickenham uh, again, raised the issue about evidence and uh, transmission, and uh, also uh, the uh, issues around those that are highly marginalised, as did the Honourable Member for Buckingham, and uh, and the Honourable Member for Orkney and uh, Shetland, uh, as well as the Honourable Member for Buckingham, spoke about the dangers of creep. Uh, if we uh, if we have this happen. Uh, where uh, is it going to uh, stop? Uh, and I think those, uh, those points have been very well made and they would have been heard by uh, my honourable friend, um, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. The honourable member for uh, Mansfield uh, spoke about the dangers of people being coerced into taking uh, the vaccine. And uh, I can point him to the very clear statements that the Prime Minister uh, has made on that uh, subject that no one should be coerced, no one should be forced to take the vaccine, it is a personal choice and of course enormous numbers of people are 
uh, including the Honourable Member for Strangford, and I congratulate him on getting his uh, vaccination. And uh, I hope it was a positive experience, and he will have been very moved, I'm sure, by uh, not just the work that the healthcare professionals are doing, but also uh, the volunteers as well. And uh, good luck with the uh, second uh, jab. And the Honourable Member for East uh, Falkirk and the uh, opposition spokesman for the SNP uh, quite rightly said that the main effort needs to be the vaccine rollout. I agree with that and I hope that we can take on these other matters a four-nation approach. I think we want uh, simplicity and uh, uh, consistency for all of our citizens. The Honourable Lady for Putney raised some questions which I think some of those will be answered by the terms of reference and, and uh, the publication put out today. Uh, and uh, absolutely she is right that we, we want to, to have uh, all efforts behind the, the vaccine programme. Uh, people are taking the vaccine because it's good for them, it is good for other people and again I think we need to come back to uh, remembering that that is why uh, we are winning this battle against Covid. It is personal action, uh, doing the right thing, uh, taken by our, our, our citizens and she, I can reassure her that we will not let up in uh, public health uh, campaigns uh, either. Uh, the vaccine uh, programme uh, continues to be successful and uh, I thank uh, all uh, who are contributing uh, to that. As we look forward now to the economy unlocking uh, and to get back to what we remember as uh, normal, whether that is being able to see loved ones, whether it is being able to uh, attend a protest if we uh, wish to, or uh, simply enjoying a, a pint uh, in a beer garden uh, with roses in bloom. Uh, if we're going to get back to that, we need to also focus on the, the practical things uh, that need to happen. And honourable members have touched on those practical and ethical uh, issues uh, today. But I also think honourable members have summed up the public mood uh, which is that they want to get back to normal, they don't want to be told what to do. If we are going to do anything in this space, it has to be of practical benefit and it has to be something that they would wish to be done. And uh, I thank all honourable members for contributing to this debate. It will help, I'm sure, shape the review and it will not be long before my honourable friend, uh, the Chancellor of Duchess of Lancaster, uh, will be back uh, to report on the findings. Thank you. Mr. Mike Hill to wind up. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir David. Um, thank you to all honourable and right honourable uh, members for their excellent uh, contributions. Uh, and let's simply hope that they review the terms of reference of which have been published today uh, progresses sensibly and in a non discriminatory fashion. Thank you, Chair. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 569957 relating to vaccine passports. As many as are, as are of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. The sitting is suspended until six o'clock. And if colleagues wouldn't mind exiting through that door while we can get the debate ready, uh, the room ready for the next debate.